evening, everyone, and welcome to Yes Catholic. My name is David Patterson. This is the place where real people share their real stories and realize it is all God's grace on the move that is working each and every day of our lives. Really excited tonight. We have Matthew Leonard here. Welcome, Matthew. Thank you so much for taking the time to share your story. Great to be with you, David. Thank you. Absolutely. So you want to share a little bit about yourself before we dive into the rapid fire, get to know you more? Sure. I am uh, I'm a convert to the Catholic faith and father of six and I've been Catholic for about 26 years, 26 and a half years now, pastor's kid. Um, I spend my time mostly, uh, thanks be to God, I get to teach the Catholic faith for a living, which I didn't even want to be a preacher as a preacher's kid, right? And somehow right. the Lord has me talking about the Catholic faith. And so I, uh, I travel and speak around the country. I've written a couple of books called Prayer Works and Louder Than Words. I spend most of my time uh, teaching spiritual theology for lay people at scienceofsainthood.com. And I'll tell you, I am just a guy who's in love with the Catholic faith and love to talk about it. Yeah, absolutely. And I was able to go through, I was just mentioning the science of sainthood uh, myself, and I loved it. So I highly recommend that you check it out if you haven't yet. So, well, let's get to know you a little bit more with the rapid fire. Ready to tackle some of these questions? Let's do it. All right. Describe yourself as a kid in three words. Precocious, uh, all American, and uh, gosh, what's another one for me? Sportaholic. Put it Sportaholic. That I love those words, man. <laughs> um, would you say a morning person or a night owl? Totally morning person. Morning person? What's, what's the wake up time usually? Uh, somewhere between 5.30 and 6 every day. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's a good time to wake up for sure. Set the day right, right? That's right. Prayer. Okay. Exactly. Okay. If you could have any superpower, speaking of uh, superpowers, any superpower, what would it be? Time travel. Time travel. Any yeah. specific era? I'm curious. I want to go back to biblical times. I want to, I want to see some of the stuff that went down. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be really cool for sure. Okay. Go to order at a coffee shop. You drink coffee. I do. Uh, you know what? I was on a speaking tour in New Zealand a few years ago, fell in love with the flat white. And uh, yeah, it's, it's like, it's, it's kind of like any other drink. I don't know what the di real difference is. Heavy espresso mixed with froth milk but it's in some kind of special combo kind of started down in oceana new zealand okay. australia i just yeah. love it man okay i'll have to check that out i'm not familiar um and apparently my my family's uh still acting out bluey right now so i don't know if you can hear it in the background <laughs> but this is catholic family life at its finest right now so we're just That's gonna right. keep going with it love it all right go to short prayer as you're going about your day memorare the memorare yeah it's a beautiful prayer. Okay, one of your favorite books of all time. That's like choosing between your children, David. Uh, <laughs> Trustful Surrender to Divine Providence. Why? I'm not... That is uh, Blessed Claude de la Colombier and um, Father Jean-Baptiste saint Jour. It's just a little okay. tiny book. I've read it many, many times. I've given multiple copies of that thing away, and it's just transformative. Okay, I'll have to, I'll have to look into that. I'm not familiar. Okay, if you could have coffee with any saint, who would it be? John of the Cross. St. John of the Cross? Yeah. Any thought of a question? You sit down with the, the what do you call it? The coffee? The flat, flat white. white. The flat, yes. You sit down with the flat white. <laughs> <laughs> what do you got? Man, to him, to St. John of the Cross? Yeah. I want him to tell me about his personal experience in the dark night of the soul. I want to know what it was like to go through and just have him kind of explicate the poem to me. Yeah, that's that's powerful. You've spoken about that before on on previous podcasts with the Art of Catholic, The Dark Night of the Soul, haven't you? Yeah, no, th this is, I mean, it's kind of embedded in the whole spiritual theology realm, right? And And yeah. the more I study the spiritual life, the more you realize that our movement into the interior life it's kind of a paradox. We think of it as moving toward Christ, the light, and there's a sense in which that's true. But when mm -hmm. you really read the spiritual masters, it's moving into darkness. It's not moving into the light, so to speak. And the reason why, in fact, John of the Cross and others will talk about it as a luminous darkness. And the reason is because God is more unlike us than like us, right? And so the more we move toward him, uh, the darker, so to speak, it gets. This is why faith is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. 
And mm-hmm. so it's this movement. And, but what happens is, is your spiritual senses get more and more tuned to the Lord, the deeper you go in the interior of life. And so what appeared dark previously gets more light, but as you go forward, it's dark again. Right. And so it's just constant right. tuning of the spiritual senses so that we can see how close God is to us. This, this kind of stuff just turns me on. I love it. Is it almost like your eyes adjusting? Yes. As you draw it, closer? It is. You know, tomorrow we got the eclipse, right? I mean, yeah. and, and everyone's going to have their little glasses on. They're going to be right. looking at all this, right? And uh, John of the Cross actually uses the analogy of staring at the sun to talk about what it's like when you are you kind of have this darkness that happens. Because he says what you don't realize is God's actually gotten closer. When you don't sense the Lord and you hit this time of dryness and prayer, Right. You, it's not that he's gone further away. He's gotten closer. You just haven't got your your spidey sense, so to speak, tuned into his frequency. And he uses the analogy of staring at the sun. Mm-hmm. Like you stare at the sun, what happens? You're blinded, right? Yeah. Not because it's dark, but because it's so bright, it overwhelms your senses. And so you can't look at it, right? Well, that's the same thing that happens with God in the spiritual life. The closer you get to him, you feel this dryness in, in, at different times because he's gotten closer to you because his glory overwhelms your senses and he's teaching you to tune into his frequency instead of using our natural senses so to speak to move upstairs and use the spiritual part of your soul yeah i remember you speaking about this in a in a podcast on the art of catholic and it's so interesting so i highly recommend everybody go and check that out so you can dive deeper into that for sure okay last one if you could ask god one question what would it be man um what what sin am I blind to the most that needs to be changed, particularly, I think, in relationship to my role as a father? Wow. Because I need to know. <laughs> and I need yeah. the grace to change it. <laughs> but that awareness, right, is, is right. the beginning. Like G.I. Joe said, knowing is half the battle, right? Yeah, absolutely. No, that's, <laughs> that's a solid question. I think I'm going to reflect on myself as a dad. So. <laughs> All right. Well, you flew through the rapid fire. Let's begin with a prayer and let's just ask our, our lady to intercede for us. And then we'll have you share your story. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy, Holy Mary, Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. St. Faustina, please pray, pray for, for us. us. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. All right, Matthew, let's dive right in. Where does your story begin? (laughs) Can't wait. Man, where where does your story? That's such a loaded question. My story begins in a Calvinist high school in Arlington Heights, Illinois. I told you before my dad was a pastor, right? And so my, uh, as a pastor's kid, my dad was first a Methodist pastor. And then he became a Pentecostal pastor. And if you know anything about the Protestant world, those are polar opposites, okay? Yeah. Totally opposite end of the spectrum. Yeah. And then a church split happened and we ended up in uh, an open Bible church. And then we went to a charismatic church. And then my parents put me into this Calvinist high school while we were going to a charismatic church. And again, polar opposite theologies, right? The, the Calvinist uh, school taught me double predestination with Don Calvin. So you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell, it doesn't matter what you do, right? God's already determined it. Whereas my church was like, no, it's free will, right? You can choose or not choose. You can lose your salvation, all that. In that Calvinist high school, I met the one Catholic family that I really had ever known. My world was so Protestant. I grew up in Chicago, David, and and Chicago is a super Catholic town, like culturally, right? Historically, I had no idea. Zero. I mean, when I when I was graduating college, I remember with the baccalaureate, I went to this beautiful basilica in uh, north side of Chicago, Queen of All Saints Basilica. I walked into this place. I looked around and my my church growing up was a gymnasium with felt banners. OK, yeah. unfortunately, some Catholic churches still look like this. But this place yeah. is gorgeous. This basilica was gorgeous. And I walked in, and I, I turned to my mom and I said, I want to get married in a place like this. And she totally laughed, right? Guffawed. And was like, you got to be Catholic for that. <laughs> That's Little true. Did we know, you know, years later, I, I became Catholic. You got ready to Catholic church. But yeah. in that, uh, that Calvinist high school is where I was kind of really heavily inundated with uh, some anti-Catholic teaching. But this one Catholic family, these guys became my buddies. They all went to Franciscan University of Steubenville. 
I went away to Oral Roberts University. And uh, back in the early days, I could, you know, pretty much win the arguments that I had with them because we'd have theological arguments. And I knew my Bible better than they did. But over time, they got more and more formed, great parents. And um, pretty soon they started raising questions I just couldn't answer. And wow. one night uh, after having the, the mom of this family was kind of like a like an EWTN mom. She had like her library, you know, of all the books she'd bought on EWTN. And if I posed a question, she would just kind of feed me a book like a Scooby snack, you know. <laughs> and uh, I started reading these books and I had questions. And my dad has a PhD in the canon of sacred scripture. Okay. So he's a sharp cookie. Wow. And so I'd ask him some questions and, and whatnot and, and never really thinking about becoming Catholic. That was the furthest thing from my mind, but I was starting to wrestle with questions. And one night at this coffee shop, I was not yet drinking a flat white. I hadn't been introduced to it yet, but at a coffee shop in Wheaton, Illinois. And for those who don't know, like Wheaton, Illinois is what Steubenville kind of is to the, kind of the Catholic world, Wheaton is to the evangelical world. Okay. Right. So we're having coffee and I pose the question to my friends, hey, do you guys think baptism is necessary for salvation? Mm -hmm. Now we didn't normally talk about this kind of stuff. We normally talk about girls and sports, right? But I was yeah. reading these books. I had these questions and it became very clear to me, like, like, is it necessary for salvation? Should it be sprinkling or immersion? Should it be infant or adult? And we're talking about all this. And it quickly dawned on me, there was no consensus around the table. Like we'd all been taught different things. We could yeah. all kind of whip out a Bible verse or two to back up our position. You know, John three, five, unless a man is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And you're like, oh, it must be necessary. Uh, book Romans 10, you know, all you have to do is believe in your heart that Jesus is God. Or that God raised him from the dead and you will be saved. Romans 10, nine. And so maybe it's not necessary for salvation. So after you know, we're, we're talking about this and it became very clear there was no agreement at the table. And finally, I asked the obvious question, like, how in the world are we supposed to know who's right? Because God is who he is. It doesn't matter what I believe about him, right? Uh, the wall behind me is yellow. It doesn't matter if I believe that it's black. Uh, Thomas Aquinas says, truth is conforming one's mind to reality. Yeah. And so I started to wrestle with that big time. And went home and started talking to my dad and asking him how come the Catholic Bibles were bigger. You know what happened with Martin Luther and whatnot. I didn't. I didn't get good answers. Right? And if I think I if I had, I would have stopped right then because I didn't want to mm -hmm. be Catholic. I didn't want them to be right for crying out loud. Right. So I started reading and uh, I started reading Luther and Calvin because they were kind of my popes and. I already knew, uh, you know, on some level that Lutherans believed different things or different kinds of Lutherans. I had no idea that Luther had a devotion to Our Lady. That blew my mind. Um, Calvin, you know, the Calvinists, all kinds of Calvinists disagreed with each other. And uh, some of the things that Calvin said were different than what I'd been taught in four years of Calvinist philosophy in my high school. And and you just keep going backwards in history, right? And what sure. happens is, is what John Henry Newman says, to be deep in history is to cease to be Protestant. Yeah. And you hit the early church fathers. And when you hit those guys, oh yeah, it's over, right? I mean, if you're- <laughs> Game over. <laughs> it is. When you, like, when you get to Ignatius of Antioch- Oh, I was just going to say, Polycarp yeah, of Smyrna. Like, yeah, I mean, all of them. Clement yeah. of Alexander. I mean, I mean, these guys- Justin Martyr. I mean, we could keep going. Yeah. And, and when they're writing in like 106 AD, that if you're outside of your bishop, you're outside of Christ. Yeah. You're like, I don't even have a bishop, right? And, and they're talking about the Eucharist and all this. And that had a massive impact on me. It really did. Um, it wasn't did you, like I converted. Did you, did you come across ahead. the Didache around that time? Of course. Was, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I read all those things. There was this little book writings of the early church fathers i think it was called or early christian writings that's what it's called and it okay. was like a just like it had them all in one little paperback and i just read this thing over and over again and and it had a, a massive impact but as i was saying you know conversion conversion isn't something that happens overnight right sometimes it happens that way with people and i i hate those people because they they just get these load of grace you know and bang they they, they see it all right they convert most of us have to go through a process because we have baggage yeah it's gradual and yeah it is it's a gradual in fact that's something that doesn't stop i mean like i became catholic 26 years ago 
Right. I'm not done converting. No, it's still it, ongoing for sure. That's right. It's a daily turning toward the Lord. And yeah. we all have issues in our lives that need to be dealt with. And so I had all kinds of things in my own life because of my upbringing and church exposure and all the rest of that kind of stuff. And, and it wasn't easy. Uh, there were times when, even when you can see it intellectually, it's hard to get there, you know, in your heart. Uh, and it's scary. There was a, a period of about nine months where I was just completely adrift. Like, and it was terrifying because everything you've been raised with just kind of seems like it's crumbling mm -hmm. and in all these holes are being poked in it and you don't have the answers. And it wasn't like I was thinking about leaving Christ ever. That wasn't the question, but how do you love somebody you don't know? Right. And it's like, who are you God? You know, exactly. Like, I, and it was very, very difficult. Um, I think I, somebody gave me Jeff Caven's number during that time. And so I remember talking to him about it for, for a little while and, and other people like one, one time, this was one of the greatest graces in retrospect. It was relatively early on. I had all kinds of questions and Mrs. Vogel, this Catholic mom who fed me all these books, she said, I, I know this priest I want you to go have dinner with. And I said, okay. And I, I was living in Chicago, working downtown. And this guy was teaching at uh, Loyola University in Chicago. And so I go pick this guy up after work. We go out to Vietnamese town in Chicago. We had a three hour long dinner. And this guy was awesome. I mean, wow. he was so smart, answered all my questions. He was super funny. And we had a great time. Pivotal moment for sure. Mm. Take the guy home. Drop him off. Thank you. You know. Two days later, I'm watching TV at a friend's house and I'm going through channels. And all of a sudden I see this priest on TV. What? I was like, I'm like, I'm like, dude, I just had dinner with this guy. Right? Like, and then his name flashes up on the bottom of the screen. It said Father Mitch Pacwa. What? And, yeah, right? <laughs> the guy's, I mean, he's like the face of EWTN now. That's wild. It was super cool. And the, and the really cool thing was that a few years ago i was down on uh, on ewt live and he's the host and it, of course he had he didn't remember that he meets thousands and thousands of people right, right. and so i related this story back to him I'm like you know you were a pivotal point in my conversion it was just really cool like full circle to be back with him that's incredible but god's been so good to me i mean the people he has put in my life and uh and you just get pocketfuls of miracle stories when you kind of go through a conversion process where the Lord just showers graces upon you. It doesn't mean it's not without its hurdles. And I, I had all kinds of hurdles as I was doing it. Family hurdles, like, you know, everyone has issues. Well, it's, it's common to have issues with your family when you're converting, especially when you come from a very strong Protestant background. Yeah. And, and my family struggled with it mightily uh, when I was coming into the church. And that's, you know, that was hard. Um, but the Lord's graces are always sufficient. You know, the biggest issue for me in becoming Catholic was Our Lady, uh, because I just didn't have context for her. Right. You know, one of the things that you're struck with when you become Catholic, like we view everything through the lens of family as Catholics. God is true. Father. Right, yep. Jesus is mother or uh, brother. Mary is our mother through the Holy Spirit, etc. Yeah. As a Protestant growing up, that's not the way you view it, right? It's me and God, and there's a reality there, right? I, sometimes I think a lot of as Catholics we hide behind other people. Like my wife <laughs> goes and prays, you know, or you know, whatever it is. Like no, when we stand in front of the Lord, it's us and Jesus. Is there grace that's that can be given to us by virtue of our familial relationship in the mystical body of Christ? Yes. Yeah. But like I, I've got to perform, so to speak, right? Right. Yeah. So that's but that's all there is in Protestantism. You know, you and you and Jesus. And so I didn't have a, a place really to kind of put Mary. And growing up Protestant. One of the things is kind of because a lot of Catholics struggle, like how, how come, you know, our separated brethren have such an issue with Mary? Why is she such a big deal? And mm -hmm. the reason is we were taught heavily that anything that detracted from God's glory 
was idolatry, right? And so that was verboten. You know, you just, you didn't do that. And that's how we saw Mary. And so we, we kind of shunned her. And it wasn't really, even as a Protestant, I remember coming to this, like, I'm a low wattage bulb, man. So it takes me time. But I remember coming to this realization, like, how come we talked about all the other figures of the Bible? But rarely we talked about Mary. I mean, as a Protestant growing up, you know, yeah. we'd have these sermon series on all kinds of different characters in scripture. But the only time we ever talked about Mary was if we were hammering Catholics for worshiping her or Christmas, you know, that was it. And other than that, she just wasn't part of the conversation. Right. And I thought to myself, my, this is the one woman that God chose amongst all those billions ever born to bear his only son. I, if we can talk about Samson, you know, or Ehu, the left-handed judge, we can talk about Mary, right? I mean, <laughs> it, it just, it was senseless. So it started to kind of dawn on me, but she was very, very difficult for me. And um, the Lord, you know, again, for people who are, who are looking at the Catholic church, and maybe you just came into the church, you know, this past Easter as we're recording, we're just past with Divine Mercy Sunday. That's right. The Lord is always going to give you the grace that you need to get over the humps and the hurdles that you have, the challenges. And for me, uh, he kind of did a twofer. I was struggling with Mary. Easter vigil was coming up. And... I think I'd picked up St. Louis de Montfort's true devotion at one point. And I was like, this is way too much. Like it was way too intense, like slaves of Mary and all the rest of this kind of stuff. And even as a Catholic, I was like praying through it. I was like, Lord, help me understand. Please help me understand. <laughs> Somebody told me when they found out that I picked that up, they're like, dude, that's like trying to drink vodka before you ever had a beer. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I was struggling with her and I moved to Steubenville, Ohio just to go through RCIA. That's it. I was living in Chicago and the RCIA was kind of, like the archdiocese was kind of a mess at the time. And Mrs. Vogel was like, you don't want to do RCIA here. Like, I don't want you to lose your faith in the RCIA class. And yeah. uh, so she convinced me to move to Steubenville. Wow. And so I did. And I wasn't a student or anything. And I just, I had no job. I just come off the mission field in Mexico. I was a missionary for 14 months in Mexico, sneaking off the Catholic churches to go pray because uh, I was kind of in the midst of the conversion experience. Right. So I moved here. I got a job on campus, just going to RCIA, sitting on some classes here and there, flat broke. And uh, I got a job and my boss came up to me one day and said, hey, Will you cover my holy hour for me? I didn't even know what a holy hour was, David. Like, I had no idea. And so they explained it to me. I'm like, oh, that sounds biblical. Yeah, I can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I said, what time? They're like, 2 a.m. 2 a.m.? Of like, course. course. <laughs> Who's praying at 2 o'clock in the morning, right? <laughs> well, I found out the Catholics do in adoration chapels. And I, you know, I'd seen an adoration chapel, but still so foreign to me. Like, there's so much foreign stuff, right? Sure. So I go down to this adoration chapel, two o'clock in the morning, and I'm all alone, obviously. I'm looking at this monstrance going, Jesus, is this really you? You know? Because wow. you're just trying to take all this stuff in. It's just very difficult. Like, I didn't have context for a lot of this stuff, right? Sure. And as I look uh, kind of around the room, and I look to my right, and there's this big statue of Mary sitting there. And I'm thinking to myself, this lady is stalking me, right? And so I like move my eyes forward and there's a big pile of rosaries right in front of me. And so I, I was like, okay, I got to deal with this, right? I needed the intellectual knowledge that was here to get to my heart. Mm -hmm. And so I picked up one of those rosaries and I said, all right, Mary, if you are who the Catholic church says you are, and the big domino for me was coming, coming into the church was authority. Right? right. It was the authority. Like Jesus gave this church the authority, his authority. And so I accepted that. And so then I, the fact I had to accept Mary, right. But it was hard to get, you know, intellectual knowledge of the heart. The head and the heart. Yeah. I said, if you are who they say you are, then here's your chance. 
Like, I'm going to throw my fleece out like Gideon. You need to show yourself to me. And so I said, I want reconciliation with my father. Because by this point in time, my dad was not speaking to me because he knew I was moving toward reception in the Catholic church. And it's hard for him you know, because he, uh, he took it, I think as a personal rejection uh, of himself. Cause and that, that's the thing, you know, and that's why people struggle so much when people be, other people become Catholic in their lives. It's because it's a personal rejection or they can take it that way. Because if you're choosing the Catholic church, that means the people who haven't are somehow wrong. Right. Mm. And that's not the way that we're supposed to, we, we shouldn't ever put it out there that way, right? But that's kind of what's happening, you know? And I want my family, like I want my family to become Catholic, not out of a right and wrong, so to speak, but because I want them to experience the grace, truth, and beauty of the Catholic Church. I want them to find what it is that I've found, you know? Because it's yeah. everything. It's the Pearl of Great Price. And I... So my dad took it very personally and it was hard. And so we weren't speaking. And uh, so I made that my intention. I said, all right, Mary, you know, here's your shot. I want my father back. And that was at 2 a.m. At 2 p.m., a letter arrived from my dad asking for forgiveness and reconciliation. The next day? 12 hours later. Yeah. Yeah. And it was awesome because you're like, not only did I get my father back, but I gained Mary, so to speak, like the spiritual mother that I'm ashamed to say, like before I became Catholic, I just, I didn't revile her, but I don't know, maybe I did, but, but I, I was not like, I wasn't pro Mary, put it that way. Right. Yeah. Because I was taught him to shoot. It was idolatry, right? That's how I was raised. And she was so gentle and merciful to me. And she still is like, mm. you know, I pray my rosary every day. Why? Because Mary said to, and, and she's my quickest way to, to the Lord. And, and I'm, I'm like, I'm in love with her. Uh, she's just, she's beautiful. And I continue to give myself to her. And it's just grace. What, what was that moment like when you opened that letter? <sighs> Um, it was a profound joy, you know, it was like, it's funny. It, it, it was almost kind of like a prodigal son moment, except I hadn't run off and gone sinning. <laughs> I'd become Catholic or I was yeah, yeah. the Catholic church. And yet I was reunited with my father and, and praise God. He was so like, he, I know that he completely disagreed with what it is that I was doing. But he was charitable to the point of saying, no, I need reconciliation and relationship with my son. Yeah. Right. And that that speaks the kind of man, you know, that he is. Yeah. And and I'm extremely, extremely thankful for that. Amen. And so what was it like to actually was it the Easter vigil when you mm -hmm. were received? It was. What, what was that like for you? The greatest. It was the greatest. I mean, uh, an Easter vigil at Franciscan University, if you've never been, they're like 19 and a half hours long. And <laughs> I mean, they're really long. <laughs> and uh, it was wonderful. And I, I, I two of my, my sister and my brother-in-law, and my brother-in-law is now, uh, he's a pastor, but he's also kind of like the equivalent of a bishop in his own denomination, Christian Missionary okay. Alliance. They came, they drove all the way from Indianapolis to be there, as did my best friend at the time and his fiance from Chicago. They did not agree with what I was doing at all. Um, but they came purely out of love for me, for which wow. I'm extremely grateful. Yeah. But I remember, and there's, you know, 1,500 or 2,000 people, the college kids right there, excited. Easter vigil, it was great. And when I turned around with my RCIA class, all the candidates and catechumens up there, I'd just been confirmed and you turn around and everyone's like, ah, you know, new Catholics, ah, these kids are going crazy. <laughs> I looked at my family and they were stone faced. Wow. And because the, you, you experience this widening of the chasm, 
right? The, the deeper you go and the closer you get to the church, the bigger the chasm. And you feel as a distance between you and your family members. And it's very, very hard. And there's a distance that's still there to this day. It's been closed a lot, thanks be to God. Mm -hmm. But it's still distance, right? And when the vigil was over, they were so upset. And I totally understand why. They were so upset, but they went and they got their own open suitcases. And they they packed the bags. And they, they went back in the car and left for Chicago that night. Like the same day they arrived. That was hard. Yeah. But uh, as I said, the Lord always gives graces. What I didn't tell you is in the midst of all of this, as I moved to Steubenville and I'd left Chicago and all the rest of this, that my mom was dying of cancer at the same time. Oh, man. And so she was coming to the end of a five-year struggle with the disease. And it, that was hard in and of itself. I, I had a question myself many, many times, like, am I in the right place doing the right thing? right? As my mother is at home dying, she had very much encouraged me to go to Steubenville to get my questions answered. Um, she was kind of a closet Catholic in a way. She'd somehow along the way developed a devotion to St. Therese. Wow. I didn't even know how it happened. Like she made a pilgrimage to Lisieux. She wrote a children's book about Therese. What? We had a statue of Therese in our backyard, right? My dad's a pastor. <laughs> How do you explain this, right? It's like who's that? Who's that lady with the roses? <laughs> exactly. That statue is now in my backyard. You know? Nice. I've, I've kept it. It's awesome. But she that. was she was going downhill, and uh, in fact, I, I left I left Franciscan multiple times to go home and just be with her, and and she'd been deteriorating greatly. And during that semester, the cancer had reached her brain, and she was essentially catatonic. Like she just wasn't responsive. She was just laying there. And on that Easter vigil day, uh, or the Easter Sunday, I mean, after I came into the church, I called home to wish my family all a happy Easter. And uh, it was awkward, right? Because they knew I'd just become Catholic. They were together in Wheaton. And, you know, they kind of passed the phone around, you know, happy Easter, et cetera. Well, they had my mom there. She was kind of like in hospice, basically. You know, she's yeah. there, but she's not really there, you know. Yeah. But they handed her the phone. And as soon as she got the phone in her hand, my mom was back. Totally and completely lucid. I kid you not. And she said, my last conversation with my mother, where she said, I totally support you. And I understand exactly why you did it. You know, congratulations. Wow. And that was it. Two months later, she died. And that was the greatest grace I could have received, you know, at that moment. And I think the great consolation out of that is people always ask me, like, you know, has anyone else in your family become Catholic? Only my mom <laughs> at this point, because Lord willing, she's yeah. with Therese, you know, uh, with the Lord. She knows it all now. Uh, but it's a great grace. And, wow. you know, David, God is so good to us. There's no reason that I should be here on your podcast talking about the Catholic faith. There's no reason other than the grace of God. And, and this goes for everyone. Everything is grace. Everything we have is grace. Yeah. And the Lord, he, he desires us. He thirsts for us. And the, the type of relationship that we can have with him through the Catholic Church is something unlike anything I've ever experienced. And I, I'm just incredibly grateful to the Lord. I'm, I tell people all the time, I'm happier today as a Catholic than I was the night I was received into the church. And I'm happier today than I was yesterday that I'm Catholic. And I think, Lord willing, that just grows in intensity because the more you get to know the Lord and the beauty of this faith, the more you, in love with him you should be because mm -hmm. this is everything. Yeah. I'm not going to lie, man. I got pretty emotional when you shared about your mom because my grandfather actually um, was very against um, me ever trying to convert him. When I, when I came home to the church, he kind of 
took me for a drive and said, you know, don't try to convert me. I'm not interested. But uh, about five days before he died, he also, um, yeah, the Lord pursued him and he had, he actually converted um, right oh, before his death. That's beautiful. And he was at the point right after he gave his life to, to Jesus and the church, he, he was also not responsive. And I walked into the, the hospital room with my brother and I had said, like, did you, did you hear about grandpa and how he had his conversion? And my brother just kind of randomly just said like, oh yeah, like I just found out about that. And right when I, I said that, that grandpa converted, both of his arms just raised up almost like you're praising God. Right. And my brother looked and just went, whoa. And then his hands just went right back down and he wasn't responsive, but it was just such a, a moment, you know, of, <laughs> beautiful yeah so it just really uh, reminded me of that so god's like, what grace a big even... consolation for you right i mean yeah, yeah. No, in the midst of, of so much yeah. his grace is sufficient in the in the midst of so many challenges god's grace is is moving right and it's true every day now i, I mean you know in retrospect you can sit back and you can tell these stories and you can relive these things and and it's most of the lots of the time a lot of times it's easy to see the grace of the lord and how he moves in our lives in different circumstances and you can see this like in the lives of the saints you'll like pop open one of their books right and you're like it's like a highlight reel of all the you know, right. incredible stuff they did and you forget these are real people right and they had their ups and downs just like we do and it's Those good moments. that's right and it's good to recount the, the times of grace and the the miracle moments that we have because that helps us to get through the difficulties that we're struggling with right now, because mm -hmm. we are, every one of us listening to this, like we struggle, all of yeah. us do, but the Lord is always faithful. He's, he's never late, but he's never early either. Right? It's, yeah. it's all in his perfect timing. Amen. Absolutely. Um, so you want to tackle what inspired you to start the art of Catholic podcast? It's hard to shut up about the Catholic faith, man. Yeah. Like what once you get turned on and uh I started on the speaking circuit, uh I, my gosh, what year is this? Man, it must be like 17 years ago is wow. when I kind of started speaking. And you know, you could start speaking and the podcasting thing started happening a few years into it. And they're like, you know, people are like, when are you gonna start a podcast? This and that and the other. And and it started for me because I got asked to be a I was on a radio show. I had like a drive time radio thing on Radio Maria back in the day, but they're like, you do it over you know, the drive home. And I'm like, I got too many kids. Like I can't keep doing this. And it, were, it wasn't like the kids were stopping coming either. And so I like, I have dinner with my family. So I, I just can't do this live anymore. And so I basically pivoted to the, to the art of Catholic. And it was a lot more frequent back in the day, but the, uh, you know, I'm still doing it. And, yeah. uh, and it's a joy just to, I get to meet some really cool people and, and yeah, find you out you know, like different experiences of how they're experiencing the Catholic faith. And it, it's really cool because this church is universal. And there's all kinds of stuff going on. Oh yeah. So it, it, it's fun. Yeah. And I love the topics that you address. Dark night of the soul. I mean, I, you could probably name them better than I can, but just so interesting. So I highly recommend if you're tuning in right now, if you've not checked out the Art of Catholic podcast, it's it's honestly one of my favorites. Um, Thanks, David. And I'm not even just saying that. Like when I met Matthew Leonard, I basically showed him my Spotify playlist, and it showed it. The proof is in the pudding. <laughs> Half of them were played. So, <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> I do. We I was trying. A restaurant. Yeah. I was trying not to to fan too much, but uh. it was great. I mean, it was it was wonderful meeting. Here we are. Look here with you with your podcast, right? And you got Man. your thing going on here. Yes, Catholic. I mean, this is great. Yeah, God, God's got a good sense of humor for sure, right? Amen. And so this and so the science of sainthood. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yeah, man, I love to talk about the science of sainthood. Yeah. Um, it's a title that I I ripped off of Saint Augustine. Um, he talks about the science of the saints, and Catherine of Siena talks about the holy science of love. And what I found as I was uh, bouncing around the country and sometimes the world speaking on the faith. Let me back up a second. When I became Catholic, and this happens to so many of us, you're so overwhelmed by the incredible stuff in the church, 
all the history, the rites, the rubrics, the sacraments, all this stuff, right? That you start going this way and that way, you know, all, and you want to learn everything. And what happened to me was my prayer life kind of went off the rails. Like I was so Catholic, <laughs> I didn't have time to spend time with the Lord. Mm. And I, when I finally came to my senses um, and, and got my prayer life back in order, and I kind of discovered what the, the saints, like the, the spiritual saints, like Teresa of Avila and others that I'd encountered a little bit, even as a Protestant, right? But I started diving into that stuff. And I remember Father Thomas Dubay, God rest his soul. I remember reading The Fire Within. And that really kind of like, whoa, like this is, well, this is cool stuff. The interior life, prayer, the stage of the spiritual life. And from there, it was off to the races. And I just started consuming this stuff. Mm. And it, it kind of took over in a good way, uh, my life. My prayer life got back on, on track. And what I found was the, the more, like every time I would speak, it didn't matter what topic I was talking about. I could talk about Mary, the sacraments, you know, whatever. I would always come back to the interior life. And I would always come back to what Jesus himself said is the one thing necessary in Luke 10. And that is your interior life and your relationship with him, your intimacy with him. And how everything in our lives are really ordered to that divine life for which we were made. To be sons and daughters of the God of the universe in his kingdom. Mm -hmm. And that just kind of blew my mind, right? Like literally we are made for divine life. And once you see that as the prize, as the end goal, like what else matters, right? And, and it doesn't mean I was suddenly able to give up all my bad habits and all that kind of stuff, but all of a sudden there's kind of a clarity there. Sure. And you're like, this is what it's all about, right? All the things that the church teaches and does, it's about this. And the more that I read, the more I discovered that there is a process by which all of this happens. Like we kind of treat the, the Catholic life, a lot of us anyway, like a, you're treading water. You know, you just want to stay in a state of grace. Just please stay in a state of grace. So that when Jesus comes back or I die, I go to heaven. Right. Right. And we don't realize that there's a process of growing up in the faith, like supernaturally, just like you grow up in the natural life. So just like you move from infancy into adolescence and adulthood in the natural life, the same thing happens in the supernatural life. And the saints have very clear guidelines for how this happens. And I'm talking specifically about people like John of the Cross and Teresa of Avila, and Francis de Sales and Thomas Aquinas and Augustine and others. And they talk about the illuminative and excuse me, the purgative, the illuminative and the unitive ways and these stages that we go through as we grow up in the faith. And when I found that, all of a sudden it gave me a roadmap. Like I knew the, the vehicles, prayer, sacraments, right? But there's a map by which we're supposed to, to travel, like right. a GPS. And so it kind of came to me, the more I studied this and the more I realized, like I was Catholic for years before I really came across this stuff. And when I would ask for a show of hands on the road, when I'm speaking, like I'd get 5% of the people raise their hands like I've ever heard of any of this stuff. So for some reason, you know, it just... It wasn't taught in seminary anymore or whatever. And priest didn't know to talk about or whatever, right? Nobody knows about it. So I started talking about it nonstop. And then I just kind of had the ideas because I was producing video series uh, at the St. Paul Center when I worked there. And I thought, I'm just going to, I'm going to start producing video series on, on the movement of the spiritual life. Mm -hmm. I didn't know exactly where it was going to go. My spiritual director was kind of working with me. He was an open state priest. He's like, you need to like put these in video. Like, so I just developed this program based on the three stages of the spiritual life. I basically went into these old like priest manuals that they used to use in teaching seminaries or like gold mines and, you know, right. Garagou Lagrange and the Dolph Tanqueray and Father Juan Aaron Taro and all these other guys that kind of systematized this stuff. And I just started making these systematic video courses that walk you through the spiritual life. Right. And I was filming a series in Baltimore on the church fathers. And I was like, Lord, what do you want me to call this? Like, what, what should it be? And I was like, I, you know, maybe the science of sainthood. I'd come across that. I'm like, man, that's a powerful title. I should do that. And there was a sacristan working at this church 
and he'd been in a car, he was either in a car accident, he'd been hit by a car or something. I don't remember, but he had lost a lot of his motor skills and his mental skills. So he was just, you know, he could function to be sacristan, but he'd obviously had some kind of mental trauma. But I was talking with him in between one of the shoots. And I started, he goes, so what, what are you doing now? You know? And so I started talking about this stuff and out of the blue, he goes, ah, the science of sainthood. No way. I know. Like, it before? No, I hadn't said a thing. What? I know. Right. That's I'm like, all right. Crazy. Thank you, Lord. Right. You're so like, Holy is, spirit moment. I'm taking it. Totally. So <laughs> this is, this is what I've dedicated my life to. The science of sainthood is an online uh, program that you, you, it's a subscription thing. It's like my full-time job. So it costs money, right? I try to make it as cheap as I can, but um, it just walks you step by step. It's these short video courses that just take you through the stages of the spiritual life and teach you basically everything you should have known or should have been taught about the spiritual life so that you can move towards sainthood, which is what it's all about. Yeah. Right? Cool. And that's it in a nutshell. That's right. That's amazing. What else is there? What else is there? You kind of spoke about how you got your prayer life back on track. I'm kind of curious if you will speak into that a little bit, just yeah. in the sense of what, what do you think was really missing? As you said, I, I was able to get back on track. Well, first of all, I just stopped spending the time. Like you get so wrapped up in Catholic stuff that you're not really doing the grunt work, so to speak, mm -hmm. of just setting the time aside to be with God. And let him I mean, love really. You. What's that? And let him actually love you. Yes, that's right. Because if you don't spend that, how can you have a relationship with someone you don't spend any time with, right? I mean, that that's exactly what it is. And, and you know, it comes with its own pitfalls because when I got like supercharged about this prayer life again, this is one of the, like, it was a total rookie mistake. I would go sequester myself off in, you know, a side room in my house. I'm like, I gotta spend my time in prayer. Gotta, gotta have this time with the Lord, right? I was like a baby crying outside, you know, it needs a diaper change or something. I'm like, no, 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 I gotta spend time with Jesus, right? <laughs> Total mistake. Don't do that. Like, don't make the same mistakes I did. Yeah. Uh, you, your spiritual life and the time in which you spend in prayer with the Lord has to fit your vocation in life and your state in life. Francis de Sales is very clear about this. That said, all things being equal, if you you have to set that time aside to, to be in prayer with the Lord. When I started doing it, it was very difficult, like just quieting myself down just to spend time with him because it's a muscle. Like you have to work it out to develop it because we're fighting against original sin, right? And so yeah. you, you got to get, you have to learn silence. And, and so when I'm talking about this to people, you know, meditative prayer is like the key. Right. I mean, this is the thing that I think if I always tell people this when I'm speaking on it, if more people had a life of meditative prayer, a real life meditative prayer, we wouldn't have a lot of the problems we have in the church or outside of the church. Yeah. Like Catholics have got to set time aside on a daily basis with the Lord. And if you've never done it before, just take 15 minutes. Set That's a timer. It. That's right. And it'll be hard. Your mind's going to go all over the place, right? And Just that's bring normal. it back. That's right. That, it's totally. In fact, Teresa of Avila says that when you experience a distraction in prayer, if you just as soon as you re recognize it, give it back to the Lord, it becomes a prayer in and of itself, right? Yeah. Well said. So you're you're making progress one way or the other, but you have to start, right? And you got to set that time aside. And what happens is when you do that, after a while, you you just keep going. You just do it, right? You just push through it. 15 minutes becomes 20, becomes 25, becomes 30, 45, an hour. And you're like, whoa, like where did the time go? Yeah. And, and the reason why fundamentally is because this is what you're made for. Like literally, you're made to pray. You're made to be in relationship with God. And so it is primary. You can go to mass every day and receive the Lord in the Eucharist, right? You can do that in a state of mortal sin. It's not right. Sacrilege. You shouldn't do it, right? But St. Alfonso Ligori says you cannot have a regular life of meditative prayer and be in mortal sin mm -hmm. at the same time. Like one of them will go. Right. Because you can't spend that time with the Lord in that kind of state, right? So... 
you have to develop this. And, and it's super simple. Like for people who are listening, like, well, I don't know what meditation is and all that. And I've written on this stuff in the science of sainthood and all the rest of it, but a really quick primer so that you can start doing it like tonight yeah, exactly. <laughs> is just go get a Bible. All meditation is, is attentive reflection on our Lord that's aided by some kind of a physical input. That's it. That's all it is. And so just go get a Bible, pop it open to the Gospels, and just begin to read very slowly. Mm -hmm. And just be in a quiet place, right? And just read slowly. And when something pops off the page at you, pause. And you speak to the Lord about it. Lord, what does this mean? Right? Are you trying to say anymore right now? Exactly. As soon as you get distracted or that moment is over, go back to your reading. Right? That's it. The key is that when the Lord shows you something, you got to resolve to act on it. Like that's the key because prayer is meant to change our lives. It's yes. meant to transform us from the inside out. So you have to resolve to actually work on what it is that the Lord shows you. And uh, again, if you have never done it before, take 15 minutes, but it, it will be really hard. You'd rather go outside and dig a ditch than spend 15 minutes with the Lord. But if you persevere through it, you will find that over time it gets easier and easier because it's what you're made for. And the Lord's waiting for you. The catechism says prayer is the encounter of God's thirst with ours. And mm -hmm. God is thirsting for that relationship. Yeah. I even heard this, this idea that when you have the thought of maybe I should pray right now, it's actually an indication that God is almost like making that effort of saying, like, spend time with me. I don't know. I found yeah. that interesting to hear that. that so. it, it is. You know, what's funny, Dave, is when people are like, well, I guess all we can do now is pray. <laughs> you should have been praying from the get go, right? That's like the first thing that we should do. And yeah. in reality, God is saying that, well, maybe now you should spend some time in prayer every moment of every day. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean you have to be like in active prayer all the time. But St. Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray constantly, right? Yep. Yeah. What does he mean by that? What he means is there's never a point in time when we're not supposed to be in relationship with God, right? right? But you can't get there until you first set aside very specific times to be with the Lord. And that means every day. The reason I get up so early, I'm a morning person, yeah. is so that I can have quiet time in my house before the kids wake up to spend with the Lord. And I need it. It's not because I'm super holy. It's because I'm not. Right? <laughs> and I need it uh, right. to, to be a dad, to do everything else that I do in my life. And I totally, when I don't do it, because I'm traveling or whatever, I totally, re I see it. Like it just plays out in my life because I'm, I'm mm. not fueling up in the way that I need to. Yeah. I would even say like working at a Catholic high school, uh, the days that I'm praying, super patient. I'm like, hey, how's your day going? <laughs> When I'm not, I'm like super grumpy pants. You know, it's like, yeah. I don't know. It's, uh, you can definitely see the difference of the Lord just totally. moving through that. So I want to kind of go back to you shared about not even knowing what a holy hour is and just your experience with Eucharistic adoration. Yeah. Powerful. You know, adoration is like radiation therapy. You know, you can't, you can't not be exposed when you're in there. And, and what I mean by that is like, I'm exposed to the Lord. And I think the more that I study the spiritual life as well, you, you know, the catechism talks about this peasant, the Kiri of ours talks to, it's like, what are you doing? Just, you know, sitting here and he's like, I look at him and he looks at me. And this is the language of lovers, you know, it's like. In the prayer life, we, the, the highest part of prayer is contemplation. You know, it's seeing God. And in adoration, he's exposed to us in a way that he isn't in another. Like in the Eucharist, I consume him, right? And he's a part of me and I'm a part of him. And, and that's the divinizing process, like in reality. Being with our Lord in adoration. I've heard so many stories of people who are like, I converted because of adoration. Like, and they barely even knew what it was. Yeah. You know, which is such a testament to the real presence of our Lord. It's a powerful, powerful thing. And, and thanks be to God, like, I have availability here. I know a lot of people don't. 
where they live. And that's a shame. Uh, if you can get to adoration, like go, like David and Solomon and then Shekinah glory filled the temple, you know, in the Old Testament. And, and they were there in the presence of God. Like, you're like, wow, fire coming down and God's presence really in there. You know, I'm like, we have that. Like, that. Yeah. we have, we've got the, the risen Jesus Christ in our midst. Yeah. Spend time with him. Yeah. Because it, it changes you. It, it just, because it's supernatural, because it's mm -hmm. God. And mm -hmm. you become like those with whom you spend time, right? Yeah. You, you spend time with the Lord and he seeps into your being so that you become like him, which is what the Catholic life is all about. I love adoration. Yeah. You reminded me of when uh, when I was back a uh, youth minister back. It was, oh man, it was years ago. But I think it's during Holy Week where the Eucharist is actually removed from the tabernacle to another location. And I walked in the church um, and the preset I was working for at the time, like I walked in the church and I just randomly was like, something's different. You know, and I was like, something different about the church right now. And he pointed to the tabernacle and it was empty. And I went, whoa. Yeah. You know, but the idea is like, Jesus is truly, if that red candle is lit, Jesus is present body, blood, soul, and divinity. And even when we genuflect and kneel, are we not kneeling to acknowledge his true presence in the tabernacle? That's right. It's it, Amazing. It's like a, you know, the analogy I always use is like going to the beach in winter time. It's like desolate, right? Yeah. And like, this is not what it's supposed to be like in this environment. And when I, you go into a church, you know, it's like Good Friday or whatever. And it's like, it's just, I don't want to say it's another building because it's still a sacred space. It's not like any other yeah. building. And yet, is there's this big hole. Like, you, Jesus, you've got to come back in here because I want to be in yeah. your presence. Yeah. Yes, it's, it really is incredible. Well, Matthew, it's been so much fun uh, being able to hear you share your story. And I just want to thank you so much for your yes to Jesus and his church. Um, you're doing incredible work for the kingdom. And, and uh, honestly, I look up to you. You're just an incredible, faithful man of God. And even when we were able to, to speak at that same conference, just when we were speaking, man, I really felt the Lord's presence. And yeah, God's doing amazing work through you. So if people want to learn more and uh, check out what you got going on, how can they do that? It's scienceofsainthood.com. That's where most of this stuff is. And, and David, I want to yeah. applaud you and your own yes, you know, to do this. And not just the podcast. I mean, you're slugging it out on a daily basis at Catholic schools. I mean, I have the greatest respect for people who are on the front lines and they're doing the work in the day-to-day -day in the trenches, you know, and, and dealing with individual lives. And I want to applaud you in that and encourage you in that and everyone else who is working in parishes and chanceries and other schools and all these things, you know, and just in businesses, right? I mean, the, the people who we're dealing with on a daily basis, the, the Catholic church is the pearl of great price. This faith that we have been given is everything. Say yes to the Lord, give your fiat and let the Lord do what the Lord's going to do in your life. And may he grace everything that you do and just continue to give yourself over to him on a daily basis and let him just empower everything you do because at the end of the day, it's all him. It's not us. It's for his glory. You know, he is everything. Yeah. Amen to that. Well said. Well, on that note, do you want to uh, close us in prayer tonight? I'd love to. And thank you again. In the name of the father. Yeah. Thank you. Father, son, and Holy spirit. Amen. Amen. Lord, you are so good to us in so many ways. You give us yourself and you invite us into a relationship with you that is like nothing else. Help us to give ourselves over to it. Fill us with your grace. Oh, help us to open ourselves to the grace that you give us. Help us to realize this grace that you give us is nothing less than yourself. And it's the best you can give to us. Help us to utilize and never waste your precious grace. To lead lives of prayer to be beacons of your love, to draw other people into relationship with you. I pray for the salvation of all who are listening, for deep conversion of heart in all of us. I pray for our family members, people who have left the church, who are far from you, never heard your name. Use us in whatever way you see fit for the salvation of the world. 
in your precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. The Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Saint Faustina. Pray for us. Pray for us. Amen. Thanks again, brother. Really appreciate you taking the time. God bless you, David. God bless.